Hey everybody, in today's video, I'm going to share with you 7 things I wish I knew about Pix Insight. Now most of these are fairly minor, but I do think they will improve your overall experience here in Pix Insight. First, we have the user interface. Because for a lot of people, the UI is just too small right out of the gate. To fix this, we'll go up to Edit, Global Preferences, then we'll come down to Core UI Resources, and I'm actually going to adjust my workspace here to make this a bit easier to see because this is actually one of the problems. So there we go. By default, it usually has automatic UI scaling turned on, and it even warns us, do not change this parameter if you're not sure what you're doing, which is a common mistake a lot of us have made. The problem is if you turn off automatic UI scaling and you enter a manual value, there's a good chance you will break the interface. And I'm going to do this just to show you because it's happened to a lot of people. I'll put in a value of four, which I don't recommend. Then I'll come down to the bottom and click on the circle, which says apply global. This is how we apply our settings. And the most important thing to take away from this is F6. This is another way to click on this button if you can't actually see it, which will be very important here in a minute. So I'm going to intentionally use a bad value here, apply it, and then I'll restart PixInsight. And as they warned us, we've completely broken the interface. I can't even access most of the stuff now. It's just way too big. And so if we go back to Edit, Global Preferences, now my problem is I can't adjust this window anymore, and I can't make it smaller, and I can no longer see the circle button. All right, so we're back here in our core UI resources. And even if I turn this back to automatic UI scaling, there's no way to physically access that button anymore down here. That little circle button, that's the problem. And even if you uninstalled PixInsight, this will still be implemented, this UI4 scaling factor. So this is just bad design, frankly, that they need to fix. But the workaround that you could use is to click on F6. I'll click on F6 when I turn on automatic UI scaling. We see that applied it. Now we can restart PixInsight, and that should solve the issue. And there we go. Problem solved. We can now actually use PixInsight again. The only problem is it's too small. So I will change this back to a value of 2, because this is just not usable at this point. But I thought this was very important to put right here at the front of the video, because I know a lot of people will eventually encounter this. And due to their bad design, there's not an easy way to work around it, unless you pay attention and know that it says F6. So it does take a little bit of awareness there, but we've fixed the problem. And there we go. We now have a usable interface, thanks to knowing about F6. Number two is the process search under Process Explorer. This is a much faster way to find anything that you want to use. For example, maybe you're watching a tutorial and they use a random process you've never heard of. Well, rather than trying to find it manually by going through this giant list of stuff, it would be much faster and easier to come over to the left here to our Process Explorer, come up to the top and just type it in. Maybe they're using channel combination. Well, if I type in channel, I have everything that has channel in it. Makes it pretty easy. Then I can click on it. It will find it from our list here. And then I'll double click on it. That's a much easier way to navigate PixInsight. And I have seen quite a few people that are missing some buttons here on the left for whatever reason. Maybe you don't have Process Explorer. The way to get it back is to go up to View, Explorer Windows, and then choose it from the list. And then it should appear there on the left. Another benefit of this Process Explorer is that it also includes custom scripts. For example, I installed a star reduction script from uh, Bill Blanchin and Mike Cranfield. I can type that in. And even though it's not technically a process, it's still available. I can double click on it. And now I have an easy way to reduce the stars in my image. And just as a side note, I'd highly recommend downloading this if you want to do a star reduction. Number three is the History Explorer, which I currently have here at the bottom. This is very similar to the history in Photoshop, and it makes it easy to go back and undo things or even see what you've done in the past. Obviously, I don't have a photo open right now, so let me take care of that, and then we'll continue on. All right, so I've got my photo of Orion here, and if I want to see what I've done to the photo, because maybe I save this as a PixInsight project and I come back to it a month later, well, one way to do that is to right-click on the name tag of any photo and choose Load History Explorer. That'll bring up our tool down here. And this is pretty powerful because now I can see that, okay, first I ran SPCC. 
It even tells me everything that it did with SPCC. Then I ran Blur Exterminator, and it says I had Correct Only turned on. I ran Blur Exterminator again, this time just using the default settings. Then I ran Star Exterminator and Noise Exterminator with a value of 0.8 and 0.25. And maybe I realize that I don't like the current state of the photo. If I want to go back a few steps, I can just double click where the arrow is. So I'll double click on SPCC. And now I'm right back at that stage in the workflow. Then I can say, okay, I understand what I did. Let me go back to my current state. I'll double click down here. I'm right back where I left off. Now, if you have multiple images loaded up, you can come down here to the bottom. There's a little drop down menu and you can select your other photo if you want to see the history for that as well. But I think this can be very beneficial for a lot of people, especially if you're coming back to your data or you're looking at somebody else's data, assuming that that information is embedded in the image. For number four, we're gonna head to WBPP, Weighted Batch Preprocessing. This is how we stack our photos in PixInsight. And the main problem I have with WBPP is just that it takes forever. This is something I noted in my beginner series for PixInsight. And in fact, just the other day I was working with a student and it took his computer over 24 hours to stack about 500 images together. So what I wanna show you for number four are the presets right here. If we click on select, you can now choose from three presets. So let's say you got 500 images, you know it's gonna take a while and you don't have that time to spare. You could come down here to the fastest with lower quality and apply that. I can't say just how much that's gonna speed things up, but it will definitely help. That would at least give you a photo you can look at, identify any problems, and then once you've said, okay, I think this will work, you can come back here to your presets, do maximum quality, and now you know you're getting the best results. On the other hand, maybe you're just new to PixInsight in general, you don't really know what to do, and you know you have good data and a good computer, just set it to max quality, and there you go. Everything should now be configured to give you decent results. For number five, we have the Add Custom button here in WBPP. This can be very helpful if you don't have an electronic filter wheel, for example. We have some data here and it says no filter. Now, this is all taken with a color camera, so that's fine. But in the past, I've used a Raza telescope, which cannot utilize an electronic filter wheel. That meant I'd have to manually install a blue filter and take however many photos. Then I pull that out, I mainly install a red filter. And because I was using the ASI Air without the electronic filter wheel, that information would not be embedded. Therefore, what I could do is come to my custom button down here and I can choose, of course, light frames in this case or darks if I'm taking dark frames. The filter name, well, if I know the photos were taken with the blue filter, I'll type in B or blue, whatever. And it does say here it can try to figure that out automatically if you leave it to a question mark. I don't know how accurate that will be. So this is why you always want to set up your auto run properly if you are using the ASI Air. For example, I would actually name my target Blue Orion, and that would make sure that every photo I take is named Blue Orion. Even though there's no filter information embedded, at least I have it in the file name. Then I'd have Red Orion and Green Orion. These are just ways to make your life easier. Again, you can do that in the auto run, in the ASI Air, just change the target name. But once I have my photos that I know were taken with a blue filter, I can implement that here. I'd select them from my list, and there we go. For the binning, if you're not sure, you can leave it set to zero, and it should figure it out but for most people we're using a binning of one. And then we have the exposure time. Again, this should be included in your file name if you've been doing things correctly, or maybe you took 50 photos with three minute exposures, and then you took 50 with two minute exposures. If you wanna stack them all together into a single image, you can just load up all your files and put whatever exposure you want to. That will ensure you have a single final image rather than multiple photos at the end of the workflow. So the main takeaway here, is that if you did take photos that didn't have the proper metadata, this is a way to work around that using the Add Custom button here in WBPP. Number six is rejection data. And what I mean by that is if we go to File Open and we navigate to our master directory, you're gonna have a bunch of photos in here depending on what you've stacked. You'll have your LN reference frames, you'll have your master lights, you'll have your master lights with the auto crop at the end, maybe even uh, another file with Drizzle, whatever you've configured in WBPP. However, if you open up just the master autocrop file, which is normally what I do, in this case I've renamed it, but if I double click on this, it gives me two photos. One which is my data, and one which is just a mask of the autocrop. And this can be very helpful for diagnosing why your photo looks so strange. 
For example, it did a really weird crop that I don't like, and I don't know why it did that to begin with. And I can see that here in the preview photo, if you will. Now that I've identified that I don't like the crop, I can go back to my directory, and if I go back one step, if you will, to this photo, we can see here that the date and time was 11-12 at 127. Then a minute later, it saved another photo at 128. This was the auto crop. So in other words, if I come back to this photo, it has not applied the auto crop. I can open this one up instead. And now we actually have three photos to look at. We have our rejection data, another rejection data, and then our photo that has not been auto cropped. This is a nice way to work around that problem if it does do a weird crop at the end of it that you don't like. But more importantly, we have these two photos right here. These show us what the stagging software found and removed. I realize this photo is a bit hard to see, but there are some streaking clouds through the photo. It was able to identify that and remove them from the final stacked image. And then with this rejection, it noticed all the planes and satellites and removed them from the final photo as well. And the reason I wanted to show you this is because I get asked all the time, I had a bunch of satellites or a plane flying through my photo. Should I just delete that image and move on? And normally I would say no, because the stacking software is smart enough to identify that those things don't belong and then remove them. But maybe when you stack your photos, you still have some satellite trails. Well, this is just another way you can say, okay, why didn't it find those and remove them? You'll see what it did and didn't remove. Now, most of the time you don't even need to look at this kind of stuff, but it's helpful to know that it is there. And that's something else I wish I would have known about sooner. Finally, we have the NVIDIA Speed Boost. So for those of you that are on a Windows computer with an NVIDIA GPU, you might want to give this a try. This is not really necessary or applicable if you're on a Mac computer or you just don't have an NVIDIA GPU anyway. So this might be just for a small subset of you watching. Anyway, what happens is if you have Blur Exterminator, Starnet, whatever, if it utilizes your GPU, by default, PixInsight will not make the most of your high-end graphics card. And so if I ran Star Exterminator on this image, it might take two or three minutes to complete. If I install the NVIDIA Speed Boost though, it can finish that in like 20 seconds. Now the steps for this are a bit complicated and you will need to know how to use a computer to actually make it all the way through. But there's two or three different articles that all say the same thing. And if you read through them, I don't think you'll have too much trouble. And if you can make it through all those steps, I think you'll be surprised at just how much faster Pig and Sight can run, especially tools like Star Exterminator, Blur Exterminator, or anything else. And with that said, there is one other thing I want to mention. If I go to my file location here, what you need to remember to do is update the TensorFlow every time you actually update PixInsight. So if you get the newest version of PixInsight from their website, you need to come in here, you'll come to the bin folder, and you have your TensorFlow DLL. This file will be replaced if you update PixInsight. And so you have to remember to go back to your downloads folder, copy that TensorFlow file back into here. That way, PixInsight continues to run as fast as it did before. I always forget to do this, and I wonder why Star Exterminator is taking so long. And then I remember, oh, I just have to replace my TensorFlow again, and that will get it back to where it needs to be. I'm excited to announce that as of December 16th, there's now a faster, easier way to install the NVIDIA Speed Boost, thanks to Russell Croman. You'll want to head over to Russell Croman's website, rcastro.com, and then check out his update here over on the PixInsight forum. And the short version is, this is still experimental, so keep that in mind. But all you have to do is come down to this URL, right-click and copy the link address, head over to PixInsight, go up to Resources, Updates, Manage Repositories, and then from here, this is how we install all of our plugins in PixInsight, whether that's the star reduction script I mentioned earlier, or Blur Exterminator, or anything else. All we're really doing is loading in URLs, and then letting PixInsight handle the rest. So if you want to give this new technique a try for the NVIDIA Speed Boost, we'll click on Add, paste in that URL, we'll hit OK, then you'll hit OK again. It might say something, just click out of that, restart PixInsight, and it will update for you automatically. That's all there is to it. That's a lot easier, right? Now, I'm not going to actually do this today because after reading through some more forum posts, he says right here, if you already have GPU acceleration working, which I do, uh, leave it alone. It should be okay, but you will end up with multiple copies and there could be some conflicts. And it sounds like some people did try that and ran into some issues. 
Therefore, if you're like me and you've already done the NVIDIA Speed Boost and you hear about this new way to do things, it's probably not a good idea to run it just yet. You may actually screw everything up. Still, if you're looking for an easy way to do things and you haven't done it yet, this is now potentially the best route to go down. And that's all I've got for you in today's video. I hope these little tips help you out and make your user experience a bit better in PixInsight. And if you want to learn more about PixInsight, I do have some videos, but I'd also highly recommend checking out Adam Block. Adam Block does a great job of giving you a lot of details on this program, including how all this stuff works, what settings to use, and more. And I've been subscribed to some of his videos on his website, which have been very helpful. So I'd recommend again you check that out if you really want to learn more about PixInsight. But that's all I've got for you today. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in another video.